Hi, thank you so much for being part of this conference. We are at the end, which um, is sad. <laughs> but um, we, we have one more important presentation to learn from today. Uh, and it's on a topic that has come up in almost every session at some point. It's, it's incredible how, how often the phrase community science has come up and, and encouraging because it is important and it is an, an important concept and approach that is, is connected to human rights. So I'm delighted that we're joined by Dr. Natasha Urugama today. Uh, she serves as the manager of community and international relations at Thriving Earth Exchange, which is an initiative of the American Geophysical Union. In that role, she's responsible for building and nurturing community partnerships and supporting new global community science initiatives. Natasha brings over 10 years of experience in disaster re risk reduction, early warning systems and climate change adaptation fields to Thriving Earth Exchange. Natasha has extensive experience in community science, partnership and development at the local, national and international scales. Her PhD in environment and geography, specializing in multi-sector partnerships for effective and sustainable community owned early warning systems is from Macquarie, Macquarie uh, University, Sydney, Australia. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all today um, and a privilege. Thank you to Teresa Harris and team for your invitation. My name is Natasha Urugama, as you heard. My pronouns are she, her. For those of you who may have difficulty seeing, I have short black hair. I'm wearing a black blouse with a black and white checkered jacket. And my background is a city skyline, specifically Chicago's. I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to speaking to you today from Hyattsville, Maryland, on land taken from the Anacostan and Piscataway peoples, and I'm in a country, the United States, that enslaved people. The reason for these acknowledgments is to remind me to think about how I can be part of repairing that harm and keep those injustices from extending into the future. So let me tell you, start with telling you a little bit more about myself and what's led me to be where I am today. Human rights and science have been central to my work as a disaster risk reduction practitioner and later as a multi-hazard early warning system specialist following my work after the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami in South and Southeast Asia. From the beginning of my career, my primary focus in all that I did was with the human condition. How might I be part of co-creating solutions with those left behind by inadequate information, infrastructure and development efforts suffering from the adverse effects of natural disasters. That deep desire led me to South and Southeast Asia in search of opportunities where I could use my knowledge to support frontline communities. As a result of the search, I ended up working with communities in Sri Lanka and other parts of the region and disseminating the results of an early warning system technology study, which culminated in an opportunity to represent Sri Lanka at a UN workshop on bridging disaster management and science technology as pictured on the slide. I came out of those experiences with an unwavering belief that communities had to come first in order for science and technology to be useful and impactful in the long term. Years later, I had the opportunity to join AGU's Thriving Earth Exchange as it evolved from an organizational recognition that direct benefit to humanity was not being attributed to the research and publication in earth and space sciences that AGU members and affiliates were known for. Thriving Earth Exchange is a program that advances the practice of community science, that is, communities and scientists working together to develop tools and solutions that address community priorities related to environmental health, pollution, resilience, sustainability, climate change, natural hazards, and natural resources. We have worked with over 250 communities in the United States and globally since 2014. And since that time, Thriving Earth Exchange has had many stories of an impactful community science. Um, 
<laughs> one of those has been um, one of those has been with um, uh, so I'll just highlight a few as they relate to the key insight science has basically contributed to the ongoing UN process to define the right to science. The first is that access to science needs to be understood as nuanced and multifaceted. People must be able to access scientific information translated and actionable by a non-specialist audience. Scientists must have access to the materials necessary to conduct their research and access to the global scientific community. So back in 2017, when we were looking for communities interested in working with scientists in Southeast Ohio and Southwestern Pennsylvania at our Geopolicy Connect conference in Pittsburgh that year, we came across the Freshwater Accountability Project's Leah Harper, pictured bottom right. She and her community were concerned about the impacts of hydraulic fracturing upon their air and water sources. Her community, Cambridge, Ohio, decided to start a project Thriving Earth's first fracking related project to help the community identify contaminants from fracking in their water. In the course of doing their project, Leah's community scientists and his team were doing a water quality analysis for the Cambridge project when some members of nearby Youngstown, Ohio noticed this work. They apparently watched and asked some questions about it, subsequently learning that it was under the auspices of Thriving Earth Exchange. Afterwards, community members from Youngstown applied to do their own project with us in 2019 and got a scientist to assess the water chemistry in their watershed. The knock-on effect of seeing scientists working with communities has led to a third project on air quality monitoring, now also completed in the wider county um, area of Southeastern Ohio. Since 2017, this and another project in Barnesville, Ohio, which is pictured at the top left um, with community lead Jill and her scientist John, have had the effect of educating rural Ohio communities about how they can take the lead and work with scientists to understand and impact an industry that is adversely affecting many of them. The series of projects beautifully exemplifies how a rights-based approach to science can support the work communities are doing to create a safe, healthier environment. So the second um, is that the right to science is not only a right to benefit from the material products of science and technology, it's also a right to benefit from the scientific method and scientific knowledge, whether to empower personal decision-making or to inform, inform evidence-based policy. So likewise, like Southeastern, or like, like Southeastern Ohio, but on the other side of the country in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, when recently minted Dr. Angela Chalk, our executive director of Healthy Community Services in the New Orleans Seventh Ward, first learned of Thriving Earth Exchange, her first project with us was on studying the effects of greening on the urban heat island effect in the Seventh Ward, which produced a community survey to learn about neighborhood preferences and attitudes regarding rain garden design and tree planting. It also led to deployment of a network of heat sensors in the community to assess the relationship between tree cover and heat in her predominantly African-American neighborhood. After this project completed, Dr. Chalk decided to apply as a community science fellow. So that's Thriving Earth Exchange's newest program to train early, mid-career, late-career scientists and even science-interested public in our community science approach in order to support more communities and she was selected as the first community lead turn community science fellow. Chalk is now leading her community with the skills to be able to find technical experts, scientists, and connect and develop more community science projects for her community. By listening and inviting communities to a conversation, we're seeing more interest in earth and space sciences and their connection and benefits to humanity. And the third is essentially uh, tools for ensuring access is that is that are in, included includes science education for all, adequate funding, and an information technology infrastructure that serves as a tool of science and a conduit 
for the diffusion of scientific knowledge. Also, scientific freedom is not absolute, but is linked and must be exercised in a manner consistent with scientific responsibility. So to illustrate this point, for decades, residents in a small community within the city of Evanston, Illinois, complained of bad odors, traffic congestion, and rodents surrounding a waste transfer station estimated to process 130,000 tons of solid waste each year. In addition to these more obviously obvious nuisances, neighbors worried that the transfer station might be causing unknown negative impacts to their air quality, water quality, infrastructure, natural environment, and health. The city of Evanston won $1.4 million in a settlement against this waste transfer station for a bunch of violations. It was then um, transitioned to a multinationally owned and no longer owned by the community. Uh, the, none of the profits were going towards the community and sadly the city basically sat on the money that they earned from the settlement and wouldn't spend it. The community wanted ongoing monitoring, uh, monitoring of air and noise pollution and city council was basically dragging its feet. So led by their sustainability coordinator, Mr. Kumar Jensen, here pictured on the bottom left, we worked to scope a project on air quality monitoring. Unlike other communities within Thriving Earth Exchange, Jensen encouraged his Environmental Justice Committee of Evanston to provide questions and interview scientific candidates. Their selected scientists went through the plan, helped to refine it, and presented it to city council. Following this work, the city gave $300,000 towards air quality monitoring, putting air quality monitors in key sites around the waste transfer station, and the mayor of Evanston asked the scientists to participate in their ongoing climate action planning committee moving forward. So we're making sure that a community on the front line as a way, on the front line dealing with a waste transfer station has the same access to science as the owner of the waste transfer station. So community science is designed to make a tangible local impact. When done well, it can enhance community capacity, advance equity, enrich scientific practices, diversify the sciences, address global challenges, and build public trust and support for science. In this context, science is understood to be an inclusive suite of activities encompassing research, engagement, education, synthesis, and application, nested in a range of intersecting disciplines and ways of knowing with diverse cultural roots. So community science actively seeks to be just, and we have been doing this ever since our inception at Thriving Earth Exchange in 2013. And we do this by working with communities first and seeking their expressions of interest over scientific research questions and agendas. We get new kinds of questions, and so it changes who can be part of science. Unlike other forms of community participation and engagement in science projects, community science is situated as an ally. We acknowledge that there is harm and we're doing restorative justice when we consider how we might repair that harm through the work that we care about and are really good at. We're clearly articulating what you can and cannot support and we must bring science to the table as a gift to repair the prior harm that science has done to these communities and other individuals. This is also behind community science being an ally. So all this to say is that human rights is deeply rooted in community science. By starting with communities first, we promulgate the notion that all have the right to benefit from scientific knowledge and the scientific method. Our scientists work closely with the communities to listen and understand and provide their expertise and insights, and also allow for those communities to provide their knowledge and context to ensure that the outcome of these community science projects are informed by all and useful to those communities. But there are many programs like ours actively seeking to equitably bring science and technology to a broad range of communities, from indigenous to faith-based to rural BIPOC communities, such as Rising Voices, Epic Network, and many more. I encourage you to explore how many of these programs are bringing science and technology to humanity in a more humane, equitable, and just manner. And so I'll leave you with just a few extra points to hopefully carry you through to doing um, human rights and all of the science and technology work that you've done and have heard during the course of this conference. 
Community science has several fundamental core values that resonate very strongly with the notion of human rights in science and technology. Community voice comes first, if you haven't heard already. All projects start from community interests, not scientific research agendas, and this helps to center human rights squarely with and for science. All communities deserve access to science to advance their priorities. Communities deserve the opportunity to ask questions about issues that matter most to them and be able to obtain the right type of science and scientists who are willing to work with them and understand their culture, context, and priorities. Science is a tool to help drive solutions. Science is, not, is one tool amongst many to help advance feasible products and solutions that work well with community knowledge, know-how, and capacity towards substantive community impact. Short-term immediate impact seeds a long-term culture of community science. So our community science projects at Thriving Earth Exchange do not aim to be the solution Rather, each project is simply a stepping stone towards a larger solution and hopefully instills an equitable way for community knowledge and science to come together. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. I'm sorry, I've turned around like this, <laughs> looking at, at you on the screen. Um, I, I, th these are such excellent examples of uh, the ways that the core concepts in the right to science can be um, can actually be out there in the world and how we can advance them to make the world a better place, make life better for individuals on the ground and communities. Um, so if there are questions, we can take them now. Uh, we have um, I believe Jacqueline is on the, the Zoom to help us if there are questions in the chat. And if you have questions here in the room, if you want to um, come up to the, the microphone over here, I invite you to do so. Hi, my name is Giza Deng here for Treatment Action Group. Um, we're a science-based advocacy organization working um, with communities across the world on global health and access um, to treatments and medications. And one of the things that, you know, we often come up against is gaining understanding within institutions that communities are, in fact, the people that have the expertise and knowledge to how to solve issues. One of the things, you know, recently there's been a lot of talk around um, is vaccine hesitancy, and of course, in a lot of cases, it is not, in fact, hesitancy, but the inability to get to places um, where vaccines are available. Um, and in some instances, you know, 15 kilometers, seven miles can be an insurmountable distance. And so I would be curious to hear a bit more about it on your approach to advocacy with institutions um, on how they can, how do you convince others to shift towards you know, coming around to your perspective of doing things? That's an excellent question. Thank you so much for that. It has taken many years, um, let's just say. Um, it, we started back in 2013 as a program that wasn't very well known. The concept of community science wasn't even understood. Um, but today, I would say that um, it has gotten a very big uptake at AGU and beyond. Um, so much so that it sounds like it was also discussed very um, avidly during this conference. So because of that uptake, um, we are able to talk to partners more about and institutions and universities about the ways in which they have traditionally done community engagement and how by listening, understanding and um, spending time in these communities, that they can really try to you know, understand what makes those communities tick before they try to institute and, and present um, different ideas, um, especially around vaccine uptake and things like that, as you mentioned. Um, because I think um, what we are, we're, we're often fed a lot of the science rather than uh, scientists really truly understanding where these communities are coming from and why they think the way they think. So I think um, it does take a lot of time, but it is worth the time and um, can really be um, can really uh, make for some uh, productive and useful tools and solutions for those communities. 
We have another question here in the room. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. So obviously you all have done a lot of work as you were mentioning for, for many years, sounds like at least a decade. Um, but in order to avoid sort of the whack-a-mole problem, right, where you're helping one community, have you all created a network of communities that have already previously been part of your program so that they can maybe help the next community or keep, keep in touch and generally uh, advance the effort? Because otherwise it sounds like there's a lot of work on your shoulders and, uh, and again, you're sort of running from one thing to the next. Over. Thank you. Yes, that's a great question. So that is definitely what has happened in the example I provided about Southeast Ohio and the Cambridge, Ohio case. Um, that, you know, by seeing um, what was what the scientist was doing in that community, other communities have now gotten involved. There's like a pretty big network of communities um, that we are bringing together every month through an all community lead call. So that includes past community leads, present community leads, those that are currently doing projects. And so they always have an opportunity to come together every month to talk to each other and to share ideas, lessons learned. And those community members who have gone through the process are now starting to bring us um, additional communities that would never have heard about us. But now because of their own experiences and most in most cases when they do suggest us, they've had positive experiences. Um, those communities are suggesting other communities and scientists who have worked on projects with us um, with those prior projects are now um, interested in doing more projects. They, they're being tapped to do additional projects with other communities. Um, so we're definitely seeing a very interesting knock-on effect that is really helping uh, beyond the partnerships that we've already made with what we call community serving partners. We have a couple questions online. First one comes from Neil Rubin and it reads, Thank you so much for your presentation. I have a selfish question. I'm in Evanston, Illinois. Do you know what has been the outcome of the project monitoring air quality here that you described to us? I actually did have an opportunity to speak to um, uh, Kumar Jensen recently. He's no longer the sustainability manager um, in Evanston. Um, and I believe if I recall correctly, and sorry, it's been a while, that the monitoring is ongoing and um, uh, they are continuing to, to, to get the data and analyze that data. Um, beyond that, as to what, um, if anything, it has shown, I do not know the answer to that, I'm sorry. Thank you. And our next question comes from Joe Carson. How much, if at all, have you or others you work with perceived engineering ethics non-violently confronting legal ethics as the 10,000 foot view of why status quo wants to remain status quo? That is an interesting question. Um, and I, I think one of the, the a question that maybe ties into that is mm -hmm. one of the things that's come up through the conference is, and it also ties back to the question earlier about institutions, um, are there professional pressures or incentives? I, I think that's it. How, how have you dealt with the different incentives that are on? Uh, professional scientists, practicing scientists, engineers, health professionals, um, who would want to do this work, but feel like, but how do I get a publication out of it? How do I, how does this fit into my career pathway? That's, yes, it's a really good question. And it literally has been the question that has um, uh, been the foundation of why Thriving Earth Exchange has come into existence. Um, we were met with a lot of um, a lot of questions about how we could expect scientists to volunteer their time for, to do this. And over the years, you know, um, I was uh, really happily surprised that many of, this, of the scientists that I started interviewing when I first started working and matching scientists myself said that they got into science um, because they wanted to give back to, to people, to communities, but they never had the opportunity to do so. And so Thriving Earth Exchange provided that opportunity. 
Um, we ultimately at Thriving Earth Exchange are trying to see how we can start to push the needle about how we can change the culture of science. And as you can imagine, it's a very, very um, steep road to, to, to try to get up. But um, we are now, um, we, we're, we're dabbling with a lot of different things, including a new community science exchange, um, which is an online portal for um, different types of tools and solutions, including papers and others, um, so that uh, scientists and community leaders can come together and, and get uh, recognition and rewards for different types of products that are coming out of these community science projects. So it, I would encourage you all to really check that out. It's called communityscienceexchange.org. And there are different ways for community leads, um, for scientists and for other boundary spanners to uh, publish and um, get recognition for the work. Um, it's still a work in progress and we're still you know, dealing now with the uh, question of uh, international scientists, internationally based scientists being able to get the rewards and recognitions that they deserve. Uh, and so uh, we continue to work on this, um, but uh, more and more institutions, I think, are, are seeing the benefits and um, the rewards of working in this way. Thank you. Well, I, I know we need to, to wrap up. So thank you so much for ending us on this forward looking uh, note with positive examples. Um, thank you. So, and, and all of the expertise. And I'm sure you will be hearing from people asking questions um, as follow up. So thanks again. Yeah, sure. um, thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, and I want to say thank you in closing to um, all of you who are here, everyone who's participated in the conference, bringing their ideas and questions and suggestions to the sessions and the workshops. I especially want to thank the session organizers and presenters. Uh, almost all of the sessions you have been involved in uh, as participants were organized by not by AAAS <laughs> and not by the SRHRL program. So we are uh, we recognize how much work goes into those and and we're just delighted to be able to give um, give those session organizers a platform and a, and a way to connect with people who are working in the same space. I want to thank the host committee, Ali Arab, uh, Aramati Casper, Issa Dang, Michelle DeGraff, Rebecca Everly, Yusuf Farhat, Julie Maldonado, Amber Neshoba, Claire Robinson, Margaret Sanders, Natalia Sianco, Gabriel Velez, Yvonne Vissing and Hamza Woodson. And um, with a special plus one to this two uh, last year's future gen scholars who were part of this uh, selection committee that reviewed the, all the proposals, ident created the criteria first, what's the theme, what, what kinds of sessions do we want? And then um, reviewed all the proposals and put together the agenda that you saw, uh, saw the last three days. Um, I also want to say thank you to uh, the Scientific Responsibility Human Rights and Law staff uh, who serve as the secretariat for the coalition, uh, especially Nate Weisenberg, who has led the organization of this conference. And also to Jonathan Drake for his work to put together the three-day uh, session, which the third day will be continued. We This is not a one-off. This is a continuing conversation. Uh, also to Joel Erickson and to Jacqueline Thompson for their contributions. And to our colleague from the AAAS meetings office, Kim Kleiberg, who has been um, amazing and in helping us pull this together. So thank you. And also thank you to AVEX and Foresight who've been helping us uh, get this all online. A hybrid conference is hard <laughs> and we couldn't have done it without them. And uh, they've been excellent colleagues through this whole event. So um, thank you too. Again, thank you to you. And uh, we'll be sending out follow-up messages for what's next. We're looking forward to working with you uh, in the future very soon. Thanks. <laughs>